Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and in this video, I'll show you how to take great photos of a total lunar eclipse, also known as a blood moon. During a lunar eclipse, the Earth gets in the way of the Sun and the Moon, casting its shadow over the Moon's surface. This can only happen at full Moon, but doesn't happen every single time because of the orbits not quite lining up. A few times a year, though, the Sun, Earth and Moon do line up and the drama can unfold. If the Earth's shadow doesn't completely cover the Moon, it's called a partial lunar eclipse, and can look a little like a crescent phase of the Moon. If the shadow does cover the Moon entirely though, you've got yourself a total lunar eclipse. But during totality, the Moon doesn't disappear entirely from view. Instead, it's faintly illuminated by very dim red light that's refracted through the Earth's atmosphere. This turns the bright full Moon into a dim red disk, which, depending on the eclipse and your location, can last for almost two hours before it emerges from the shadow and is gradually revealed once more. And that red light is why some people call it a blood moon. Lunar eclipses are much easier to view and photograph than a total solar eclipse. There's no danger involved, the period of totality potentially lasts for much longer, and they're also viewable across a much greater area. To find out where and when the next eclipse will take place, head over to the NASA Eclipse website run by the Goddard Space Center and link below. There you'll find details of every lunar and solar eclipse decades in advance, as well as previous ones for reference. Each eclipse includes a detailed map showing where it's visible on Earth and where you'll need to be to experience totality. Like all eclipses, the next one may be far from home or even inaccessible, so just skip to the next one until you find one that you can see or at least are able to travel to. You can photograph a lunar eclipse with any camera, but for the best results, you'll need manual control over exposure, a telephoto lens for a closer view, and also a tripod to keep everything steady. A DSLR or a mirrorless camera is ideal, but you can also get away with a compact super zoom camera or even a phone in some situations. First things first, the moon is very small in the sky, even with an average telephoto zoom. Here's how a lunar eclipse looks at 300 mm equivalent, where it's tiny against a featureless sky and now at 1000 mm equivalent where it's still less than half the frame size. But high resolution cameras allow you to crop significantly and when you enlarge the smaller version for use on videos or social posts it can still look okay. Also remember the full moon, whether it's lit by white or red light, remains almost bereft of any shadows so there's hardly any detail to see on it anyway. Next for exposure, the moon will go through a huge range of brightnesses during a total eclipse, starting off as a bright full moon, before gradually darkening and becoming very dim during totality. So set your camera to manual exposure mode, select RAW and JPEG quality for the greatest flexibility, and try these settings. During the early phases, where the shadow has only taken a small notch out of the side, I'd recommend setting the sensitivity to 100 ISO, the lens aperture to f5.6, and trying shutter speeds between a 60th and 250th of a second. As always, this is just a starting point. Play back your images and adjust your exposure as required. Bear in mind that the moon is much brighter than it looks, so ignore your camera's suggested settings or you'll end up with a horribly overexposed blob. As more of the moon is covered in shadow, it will become a lot darker. My favourite part of a lunar eclipse occurs a minute or two before or after totality when you can expose for this dark shadowy area, revealing the dull red colour, while grossly overexposing the thin sliver that's still illuminated bright white by the sun. For this kind of shot, you'll typically need to increase the camera sensitivity to between 800 and 3200 ISO, and use longer exposures of around half a second with the lens set to f5.6. As before, it's a starting point. If the image becomes too bright, try a quicker shutter speed or a lower ISO, or indeed vice versa. Suffice it to say, at this point, you should definitely be using a tripod with either a cable release or the self-timer to avoid wobbling the camera as you take the picture. During totality, the moon will become very dim, forcing you to use exposures of, say, one or two seconds, even with the sensitivity increased to, say, 3200 ISO. And if you're using a telephoto lens for a closer view, then the rotation of the Earth will become an issue. With very long telephoto lenses, the moon will visibly move a little during a one second exposure, causing some blur. You can see it here not only moving due to the rotation of the Earth, but also wobbling in the wind. So unless you have a special astrophotography mount that can track the moon, your only option is to keep exposures typically to less than a second for long lenses and simply bump up the ISO until you get the desired brightness. Oh, and if the moon is low in the sky and close to the horizon, it will be even dimmer than normal and potentially a little distorted too due to atmospheric effects. 
In terms of focus, I'd recommend manually focusing on the moon while it's still nice and bright and remembering to play back that image and zooming in to confirm that that focus is correct. Once it's all looking good, you can just leave the camera and lens set to manual focus so that it doesn't change during the event. If you're including a foreground element like a monument or landscape, you'll need to choose which you'd like to be sharp. Since an eclipsed moon can already look a little bit fuzzy, I'd focus on the foreground, but again, it's worth experimenting. Including a foreground element can hugely improve any moon photo, eclipsed or otherwise, while also being much more forgiving on smaller lenses. I took these around Berlin during the July 2018 total lunar eclipse, all at 400mm equivalent. The moon by itself is fairly small in each image, but place it next to a building or landmark and you'll not only fill some of that blank area, but add some context to your location. One of my favourite eclipse photos was taken in Brighton in January 2019, where I managed to line the moon up with the i360 tower. This was at 300mm equivalent, so again, not a particularly large moon on the frame, but the tower transforms the shot, especially since it was fortuitously lit. And this is an out-of-camera JPEG with no post-processing. Now, while my Berlin shots simply involved wandering around town until I randomly found a building that lined up attractively with the eclipse, the Brighton image was carefully planned beforehand. So to wrap up this video, I'll show you how to prepare in advance for an eclipse. Step one is, of course, to find an eclipse that will be visible from your location using the NASA website. Here's the report for the January 2019 eclipse where the map shows it being visible in its entirety for North and South America, while the UK was at the edge of the shadow towards moonset. This meant that the total eclipse would be visible, for me, early in the morning before sunrise as the moon gradually lowered in the western sky. Since Brighton's south-facing seafront runs pretty much east to west with the tower somewhere in the middle, it should be possible to include the tower and the moon in the same shot if you position yourself east of the tower looking to the west. Unlike the centre of Berlin where buildings obscured much of the eclipse, the seafront location allowed for more wriggle room to adjust my position to line them up as desired. While I could have just turned up on the morning and walked back and forth or side by side a bit to line up my view as desired, I didn't want to waste too much time, especially given that this particular eclipse from this particular location did not have a very long period of totality. Plus, I also didn't want to have to get up earlier than I needed to. So I scouted the location beforehand using the Sun Surveyor app on my phone to superimpose the position of the moon over a live view. You can set the exact time and date in the app to match that of when the eclipse will take place. So while I filmed this in 2021, I've rewound the app to January 21st, 2019, the date of the total lunar eclipse. As I shuttle the time back and forth, you can see where the moon would appear in relation to the tower from this position at this time and date. And you can see I'm too close for it to appear halfway up, which is where I want it. Instead, it would be way too low. Plus, I'm too close to photograph the tower with a telephoto lens from this position. So now I've moved back by about 200 meters and tried again. The moon's path is now higher in relation to the tower, but passes over the top. Now, it could be fun to visually balance the moon on top of the tower if you're into that sort of thing, but I wanted it about halfway up, nearer to where the viewing pod is sometimes parked overnight. So this time, I've moved roughly halfway between these first two positions, and it's third time lucky, as according to the app's preview, the moon's path would now cross behind the tower. Perfect for my picture, but ironically, it puts me right in the middle of the road, which obviously isn't ideal, but there's a protected area and pre-sunrise, there won't be much traffic. Now, depending on your phone, the GPS and the reception, you're not going to get a 100% accurate preview, but it is going to be close enough to give you a really good starting point without wasting too much time on the day. On the day of the eclipse, it actually proved almost perfect and I only needed to shuffle a few meters side by side or back and forth to fine tune the composition as the moon gradually tracked across the sky. I was also far enough away from the tower that I could use a telephoto zoom and still have both objects in the frame and both mostly in focus. Again I focused on the tower here. This is always a consideration when trying to include a monument or landscape with the moon. If you're using a telephoto lens for a larger moon you'll need to be quite far from the foreground subject too. It can also be fun to film some video, exploiting the Earth's rotation to move the moon across the sky and past your landmark. I've greatly sped up 15 minutes worth of footage here, although I had to zoom out to keep the moon in the frame as it passed behind the tower. I should have used Sun Surveyor to ensure a clear start and end point for this video, but it's all a learning process for the next one. Oh, and if all you want is a red moon, you may not even need to wait for a total eclipse. 
When the full moon first rises, it often appears reddish when very close to the horizon. This photo was just a normal moonrise that I took alongside Brighton's Old West Pier, and I've explained loads more about photographing the moon in my separate tutorial, which I've linked to here. If you find any of my tutorials or reviews useful, please do consider subscribing. And that's everything you need to know to photograph a total lunar eclipse or a blood moon. So find out when your next one is and give it a go. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.